Sounds like bingo. Let's let's kick it off. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks uh, for joining us. And thanks to the participants. We've got uh, 136 people who signed into this. So clearly uh, an attractive um, conversation that we're going to have or a topic and um, and the draw cards of, uh, of our esteemed panel. Um, which I'll introduce in a second. Rules of engagement, of course, for those who are participating uh, in the background, please do put some questions on the chat. Um, that is being monitored, and I will, of course, try to pick all of those up. But of course, um, we've got the UKA in the background also helping with that process. Um, it is um, lovely to welcome our panel. Uh, we've got Will Waller, um, who's a director at Arcadis. Um, clearly started his career um, when he was about 12 because he's a fellow of the RICS. <laughs> by any stretch, you certainly don't look old enough to, uh, to be a fellow yet. Um, but you've got a lot of experience um, across infrastructure and property in um, main contracting and consultancy covering commercial management, business advisory and research. And uh, you're heading up Build to Rent for Arcadis. Welcome, Will. Thank you. Thank you very much for co-hosting this session with the UKA. Um, Lord Gavin Barwell. I've never, I've never had the privilege of a Lord. <laughs> uh, Minister of State Housing and Planning between 2016 and 17 um, and currently the House of Lords. And um, I'm not sure if you need much introduction, um, Lord Barwell, but I am rest assured you said that you don't like to necessarily be called Lord. So we'll just go with Gav, shall we? So, so. Gav works fine. <laughs> Um, James, welcome. James Brakeley, Planning Director at MODA. Uh, you've had, uh, again, quite a long uh, esteemed career and don't look old enough to have 30 years of property uh, industry planning experience. Um, but you are a member of the town, Royal Town Planning Institute, a governor at Manchester Cathedral and a member of the Cathed uh, Cathedral Council and a trustee of Volalition, as a, which is a charity focused on securing employment opportunities for the long-term unemployed. That's quite interesting and, um, and a very good thing to do, I would imagine. And we've got Dave Butler, the CEO of the UKAA, who's uh, um, essentially sense checking us, I guess. Um, <laughs> welcome, Dave. So interesting topic today, lifting build to rent in the halls of power. That's you guys, halls of power. Um, how can the sector elevate itself with policymakers? Now, there's a, there is a question that we might ask at the end is that, do we need to help lift uh, build to rent in the halls of power? But let's start with how do politicians see the sector? Um, and I might go to first and foremost, Gav, and then uh, over to you, James. So what's your thoughts, Gavin? Uh, so I think that for a lot of politicians, it's not really on their radar. Um, I think you know we have a system very much in our country where obviously MPs uh, represent particular geographic parts of the country, particular constituencies, and because the sector isn't universal across the country, there's lots of MPs who won't have experience of build to rent from their individual constituencies. I guess it's growing. You know, initially, the sector started out maybe in central London, Manchester, and it's it's beginning to spread to other places. So awareness is growing a bit, but most of the housing debate tends to view the private rented sector through purely through the prism of sort of small individual landlords. So I think there is a there is a big job to do in terms of growing awareness among politicians generally at a national level. I think you've got better awareness in those local authorities where there's an existing build to rent presence and, and reasonably good awareness within the officials in the MHCLG department, which is obviously the key department in terms of uh, policy making. So, you know, I think um, maybe the key question, Leslie, is, is, as you say, is there really a need to grow it? Is it, is it working as it is, being a little bit below the radar? But I guess if, you, if, you, if the ambition for the sector is to grow into a wide, wider range of places, then there is a strong case there for uh, making sure more, more MPs understand the contribution that it can make to tackling the housing crisis. And you're saying it's, not, it's sort of not yet, it's sort of in the peripheral, if you like. I mean, there's so much media around build to rent and maybe that's also because we're in the property sector and that's the type of um media that we we read and and obviously the housing crisis is is a massive um uh topic in the halls of power is it is, is there something that we can do better to promote ourselves 
in in the halls of power because obviously we we want to be part of the solution and i think we are part of the solution what is it that we're not doing in that regard so i think i mean the, the you know you said there's loads of coverage in the property video but most mps won't read that right. you know they are, they're bombarded with information all of the time and so a lot of their views about policy are actually shaped by their experience as constituency MPs, by what they see in their constituency visits, and uh, by what they get in their constituency casework in terms of the members of the public that are contacting them and, and raising problems with them. So yeah. if they haven't got a build to rent presence in their constituency, and they're not someone who is taking a specific issue in housing policy particularly, they're unlikely to come across it. So I think that the starting point is clearly to work with those MPs in the areas where the sector either has an existing presence or is intending to develop a presence at a time. And so one of the bits of advice I would give you as, as a former constituency MP is to actually get MPs or lo indeed local councils as well along to visit sites and actually see the product, look around the schemes and get an understanding for the contribution it can make. Because a lot of politicians have got significant concerns about the private rented sector and actually introducing a degree of professionalization to that sector will be a very attractive uh, message to them. So I think there's lots of potential there, but it, I, would, I would encourage more than, rather than trying to sort of bombard people with mailings to their parliamentary office, which are unlikely to be read, engaging with people individually, getting them to come and see sites is the most productive way. Okay, yeah. So um, James, just coming to you, same question. How do you think politicians see the build to rent sector from sort of the other side of the fence, if you like? Well, we're an operator, so you know we've had some great experiences at the local level, and I agree with Gavin. I mean, there's a distinction between the sort of the local and central uh, political levels in in terms of the appreciation, and I think there's a great distinction to be made again educationally between what is the private renting sector and what is built to rent. So institutional built to rent, which is what we do, um, is all about you know lifestyle, health, well-being. You know, we are long term investors and that mutuality in the local level where local authorities are investing in great places and spaces is exactly the same thing as what we're doing. So we're not investing in sites necessarily. We're investing in locations and locally. Once you start to talk to politicians, I think they get that. And I think there is a, you know, is a, a wide appreciation of the way that the built to rent sector can deliver on the ground. And for us, it's all about delivery. So, again, that sort of neutrality of objective from a you know the leader of the council or the chief exec or the local mp i think is very clearly understood now there are certain authorities that we've been into where there is this reluctance to engage with us um and i think there is this chipping away you know we need to sort of bang our drum a bit louder you know the mood mood music needs to get louder all of the time in relation to what we do but you know, I think as we emerge from COVID-19, hopefully, the repurposing of city centres, you know, they need to become more diverse. You know, there's going to be a greater blend of diversity within our city centres, and Built to Rent's got a huge part to play in that. And, you know, when I was, you know, being very kind, I mean, certainly um, 30 years seem to have kind of drifted past rather quickly in terms of my career. But nevertheless, I, was, I once read this piece where a major developer said, when I can see school children walking across the city centre from school to home, then we'll have been successful. And I think there's a great deal now to focus in on in repurposing sort of city centres as we come out of COVID. And I think Built to Rent's got this huge part to play when we're creating these great places with long term management and stewardship because it's in our vested, collective vested interest to do so. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to come back to a point with you, James, about MODA specifically and what they're doing. But um, Will, um, what experience has have, can you reflect on about the sector on, at a local and central level? Yeah, so I think I agree with a lot of what um, Gavin and James have just articulated there. I think, you know, at the central level, you know, actually there have been real examples of, of real support and encouragement from government. So going back to 2012 with the Montague Review, um, some of the, the you know the BTR guide for local authorities, the uh, some of the funds, um, obviously the, the guidance and the MPPF. So you know there there is actually <clears throat> uh, support there. So that's been really positive. I think as we've said, you know obviously there is a presumption for ownership, and I suppose in some ways by definition that that puts uh, you know private rented sector behind that. But actually, um, certainly um, 
recognize what Kevin's saying around maybe the product isn't fully understood by you know what we might describe as the whole political class uh, and uh, and Gavin's point there around it being lumped in with you know the buy to let world um, and actually perhaps the benefits of a dynamic private rental sector aren't fully appreciated and I think that's particularly important in the new economic reality where actually probably flexibility for people is going to be really important um, of course the sector can offer that um, and I think the other thing I would say is that maybe the additionality or is how we might describe it of BTR isn't necessarily appreciated so I think often um, development is viewed through this you know sort of zero sum game, zero sum game lens in terms of for sale and for rent and actually it's it's not necessarily the case, um, you know, where uh, one might be viable, the other may not be. So it, I think the point being, BTR has an important role to play in increasing the overall delivery of housing. So if that's the case, Will, what, what should the sector be asking of local and central policymakers if, if, if that's the sort of paradigm which you've, you know, talking about flexibility, additionality, all of these benefits that the, sectors of, that the sector and the tenure offers, what should we be asking of the policy Yeah, so I think, um, you know, proactive engagement and, you know, and both Gavin and, and James have mentioned that already. Um, and of course, the onus is on, on the sector to really drive that as well. Um, I think, you know, probably across both central and local, there are things that could be looked at around in terms of you know, allocating land parcels in local plans, for example, that could, uh, you know, specifically for BTR, that could help break down some of the issues around land competition with the for sale market. Um, there could be, you know, even more focus on bringing public sector land assets forward for BTR. Um, could look at how, you know, the viability position is assessed in terms of affordable housing, and perhaps we can get onto this in a bit, but could look at, at what some of the uh, consultations that are out there at the moment could mean for that, for example, with first homes. And there could be, you know, a sort of more intensive look at, at Brownfield, um, and, and whether that could uh, be more proactively put forward for BTR development. Um, and then I think, you know, probably want to just pick up on a point around perhaps tax as well. So, um, you know, SDLT relief could be looked at in terms of both uh, the 3% surcharge on additional uh, dwellings, but also the, the foreign investor surcharge as well. Actually, could, uh, could it be looked at that BTR uh, could be exempted from those um, to help drive that investment. James, do you have anything else to add to that uh, wish list or uh, ask? Well, I think it's more about, I agree with that, but I think it's about recognition as well and acknowledgement that Build to Rent has got this you know, tremendous offer. I think if you, when you look at the sort of the key messages government are trying to, I think it, to a large degree, correctly uh, promote, which is you know sustainable development, high quality design, inclusive communities. That's what Build to Rent is all about. And I think... I think you were going to ask me about the mode or offer and that's really where we sit we're long-term investors with a focus on health and well-being curating and delivering communities um with this great emphasis on great spaces both internal and external and again what we've seen in relation to covid again is people looking at the spaces within which they live and work uh, and we're blessed, you know, within the schemes that we're promoting with this great balance between the two. And I think there needs to be this sort of recognition uh, within government, central government, that is, that, you know, there is, and I think Will mentioned that word choice and flexibility. I mean, the Prime Minister in the white paper, and I'm sure we'll come on to talk about that in a minute, talked about matching homes to people's talents, you know, geographically. Well, that requires flexibility, and that's what we're all about. And and that value for money, we you know, no deposits, no service charges. It's very accessible, high quality accommodation that we provide. So, I think there's that recognition and an acknowledgement. There's an educational piece, um, and I think it's hugely disappointing that the white paper didn't even reference Viltaren at all. It's not one reference to it. Um, and it's a white paper focused on planning. I appreciate that. But really, the overwhelming focus was on housing. And so built to rent didn't get mentioned, you know, custom housing didn't get mentioned. They, you know, there was there should have been a greater emphasis on that element of choice. So, James, I um, I'm really familiar with the motor offer. I think it's amazing. I think that what uh, what the proposition is, is is fantastic. And it's um, it's it's also helping the sector as a whole. Um, uh, lift the profile, um, which is which is all, all good news. Playing devil's advocate on the other side and thinking about you know the inbox of the constituent um, 
minister and so forth, and you know the housing need as a whole, there has been, uh, I guess you could say, not criticism, but um, a feeling potentially that build to rent is a bit exclusive. And I know we do include, we do make inclusive communities and focus on really good design and so forth. But some may say it's elitist and it's a bit, um, it's not really addressing the housing need where it's me needed most. And I just, and I'm honestly playing devil's advocate a little bit because we do, we are a very small portion of, of the housing sector and we want that recognition, which is all good. But how do we sort of, how do we potentially flip that on its head and look at more, you know, affordable um, build to rent housing types? And maybe Gavin, this is something that you could comment on. Is this something that you come across in terms of that, the halls of power that people see, um, Built to rent as somehow sitting outside of the realms of sort of the wider housing need. You've, I think there are probably two problems you've got to work around, and they come from different ends of the political spectrum. So James touched on one of them, which is probably more an issue in the corridors of power nationally in terms of the government, which is their focus is on ownership. It's on trying to help more people to own their homes. And the way I would describe this is if you take the sort of Cameron Osborne government sort of 2015, housing policy was almost exclusively focused on trying to get people into ownership. You know, you had trying to introduce right to buy for housing association tenants funded by the sale of high value council assets. Uh, the affordable housing program was nearly all about um, shared ownership. So the policy was very heavily built that way. When I served as housing minister under Theresa, she very much had a sort of 10 year blind policy. It was like build more homes of every single kind and build to rent fitted very comfortably into that as a, as Will was saying, as a source of additional money. It wasn't, wasn't taking funding away from the other things. It was new money you were bringing into the sector. Hmm. This government, I would say, is like halfway between, the two. it's moved back towards the ownership focus, but it hasn't gone all the way back to where the government was in 2015. So I think, the argument you've got to win there is yes, of course it's right that the government wants to help people that want to own homes to do so. But the reality is A, some people will never be able to afford that. And B, lots of people are gonna want or need to rent for a period of time before they own. And the government's got to have something to offer those people as well as the people that are ready right now to get on the ownership ladder. Then I think the second thing is the thing that you put to me. I think on the left, you do get some councils whose focus is almost purely on how do we get more affordable housing and in particular in an ideal world how much do we get how do we get more social rented uh, accommodation built in our area and therefore built to rent isn't the answer to that concern and I think with them um, you've got to uh, you know both address the need for a mixture of tenures it's just as wrong to say we should simply build more council homes and nothing else is to say we should simply build homes for people to buy and nothing else and also, you know, I think many of the best build to rent schemes do include an element uh, of product that is pitched lower down the market in terms of, of rental value. So it is, it's not fair to say that it is not addressing the problem at all. And there's finally, there's the argument that, of course, if, if you build higher quality, professionally managed rental accommodation with, with uh, owners, as James is saying, who are in it for the long term and there to improve the places uh, that is going to free space up elsewhere in the market and make council's job more difficult for the people it needs to find accommodation for so i think you've got to be conscious of both arguments you've got to win there one is probably more with the national government and the other more with certain local councils around the country can i come back on that as well? yeah of course so if you consider angel gardens and again picking up this point about sort of the demographic our, our youngest our resident is six months and our eldest residence is approaching 80 and then when we look at our stats more recently um, just over 40 percent are people who have come from other rental properties but really interestingly about 45 percent of people who've come from uh, home ownership and or from their parents homes and they've moved into rental accommodation it's about so that have element of choice and it's also about multicultural about a quarter of the people that live in angel gardens in manchester uh, from a multicultural background from 12 different countries so again it's that element of choice and that value for money which 
So it's extraordinary, actually, because, as I mentioned before, no deposits, no service charges. So it's a very accessible accommodation. And within your package, you get you know, digital infrastructure, which, again, has become extremely important as we're sitting here on you know, Zoom right now, um, alongside all of the facilities in terms of 24-7 concierge, immunity rich, uh, information uh, facilities that we provide in terms of gyms, communal kitchens, libraries, gaming, and all the rest of it. And that health and well-being focus all sits within that package. And whether you want to furnish a package or not, it doesn't cost you any more money. And, and we do, Gavin's absolutely right, we have affordable housing within our developments. Um, and they're tenure blind. You know, whether you're a notional private person or a notional affordable person, it doesn't make any difference to us as Moda. You know, you get equal access to absolutely everything. So the only person who'll know will be when you fill in your, you know, you'll pay your rent uh, every month through the My Moda app. Um, and that's the only way that, you know, that would be that distinction monetarily. So, you know, that offer is hugely inclusive and accessible. Yeah, and I agree. And James, I was honestly playing devil's advocate because it's always right. helpful to see both sides of that story. And actually, I think with the fact that this is a proposition that is relatively new to the UK, there is an, potentially a, a sort of a, what's the catch? <laughs> it's too good to be true but actually of course because we've got amazing scale in these developments we can add on value to to residents that wouldn't otherwise be possible so by individual you know landlord ownership for um uh, buy to let it's long term and i think that's one of the key things it's long term long term stewardship and management you can take a view and, yeah and, and leslie if i just come in there and make a couple of other points as well i think um you know the other thing that that, that um could be recognized is that you can create communities very quickly because actually the absorption rates tend to be, you know, two, two and a half times that of for sale. So that could be a real positive, particularly as we look forward at the, at the recovery. Um, and the second bit is actually, there's a real opportunity there for local authorities to, to partner with the private sector and actually use build to rent uh, potentially as a vehicle for, for, you know, for revenue generation as well mm -hmm. um, as meeting some of their other uh, community led objectives. Um, and yeah, Arcadis, um, you know, we've done an awful lot of work with um, clients in local authorities um, and, and other, and other organisations to, to help set those JVs up and, you know, they can be extremely successful. Absolutely. And also the other part of it is around the economic stimulation of bringing, you know, that many, what's the total capacity of, let's say, Angel Gardens once it's full? We've got 466 new homes there, so that will be a resident population of around about 1100 to 1200 i would say so that's you know, 1200 people who are shopping locally living in the center so local center hopefully uh populating the schools um you know yeah. the community uh the community groups um uh working and um stimulating the economic areas so th there is uh, absolutely so much about that community and for council so in that sense, Will, just along the same vein, what can the sector do to support the joining up of approaches in terms of local, regional and national in your experience, in your opinion? So, I mean, I think the first one is, you know, share knowledge um, and, you know, work, work with all the stakeholders really to inform about the product, inform about the offer and the, and the benefits it has. I think, you know, a really key one, and it's one the sector is, is pretty good at by all accounts is can you know to continue to delight customers and actually continue to be great stewards as uh, as james is saying because actually you know where people are going you know if people want btr where they live then of course that will really help with the the narrative but also joining it up nationally and locally um and i think it's worth saying actually that and you know we, we've heard this from a lot of clients um of ours that you know, lockdown has has really shown the BTR in in a great light in terms of it's really performed very very well at looking after people um, and delivering a great a great customer experience through that challenging time. So I think we've got a great that provides a good springboard to to build upon even further. And I think you know the last point probably is around um, and I think we've touched on this, but it is staying focused on the outcomes. Mm -hmm. So you know those bigger picture objectives around providing more homes and, and contributing to the housing challenges. Um, and, you know, as to what James was saying, really, and Gavin, actually, you know, that improving local communities. Um, and we haven't even talked about, I don't think in detail yet, the environmental side, but actually having those um, aggregated points of ownership could be very, very um, useful in terms of accelerating the environmental agenda as well. Mm. 
segueing, and I'll come back to asking your question on that same joining up of approach regionally, nationally, um, locally, James, but segueing to the environment, Gavin, in the halls of power, where does the environment sit in relation to, I guess, more specifically in terms of housing and, you know, is it is it high up on the agenda? Is it something, or is it just more like it's something that we'll deal with and it's high uh, I think it's, I think it's coming up, up the agenda very fast for, for a number of reasons. Like, so first of all, I think it's it's very likely that the pandemic is going to teach us all that we need to take natural threats more seriously. So the climate change issue is clearly coming up the agenda for that reason. I think among politicians and, and among voters as well, there is a sort of strong desire not to go back to the world of January 2020, but to, to build back better as the, as the catchphrase goes and building back greener is going to be a big part of that. The UK is obviously hosting the COP26 conference. It was due to be this autumn, but it's now going to be next autumn. So if you're Boris Johnson and you're trying to uh, de demonstrate UK global leadership post Brexit, that is the biggest single platform he's got. Uh, and so I think there's going to be a big incentive there. And then finally, you know, if you look at some of the people that are most influential on him, Carrie Simons, his, his new partner, Zach Goldsmith, he's very close to, they are passionate about this issue and um, will we'll be pushing the government further along in this direction. I think when it comes to housing policy, you know, it is true, therefore, that you're going to see a bigger focus on improving the environmental standards of new homes. But it's important, I think, that the debate doesn't get too fixated on that. The reality is most of the homes in this country in 2050 have already been built. So if you're if you're focusing on what you're doing about reducing emissions from housing, the primary driver of policy has got to be what do you do to improve the environmental performance of the existing stock, whilst also making sure that the new homes we build are built to a much higher standard and are not adding to the problem. Mm. And there is obviously um, something quite big about embedded um, footprint of, of um, carbon and operational carbon and, and how to offset that. So, James, did you want to comment on anything environmental in terms of the housing before we go back to the joining up of the sector? Sure. I mean, there's, there's the techni technological side of it and also the operational side. So uh, at Moda, we take it very seriously. We've just announced um, a partnership with Utopi. Um, so we're going to turn our buildings, our future buildings and our current building into smart AI buildings. Um, so and through that and through the management of those buildings, you're looking at savings in sort of energy consumption of 40 to 45 percent. Uh, we're looking at sort of cost cleaning regime um, enhancements through sort of thermal imagery and um, sensor in terms of movements within the buildings themselves and we're looking at savings in terms of the maintenance costs with a smart regime of around about again about 40 percent so there's quite a bit that we can do I think because we're an operator also you know there's there's a greater element of promoting a a control if you wish about you know banning simple things like banning single-use plastics in the common areas you know all of these things all add up together and we've got a range of things that we're sort of promoting operationally in terms of buying you know friendly cleaning uh, fluids and things like that so there's a whole range of different things that we can actually manage all the way through to you know procurement and construction as well so no, I think this this is a continuing agenda. This is something that will continue to be refined and we need to get better at it all of the time. Mm. Uh, but we need to do it together. You know, there needs to be that sort of collective agenda between all of us to do it, um, to make sure that we're going, we're going to deliver on this sort of like the zero carbon um, agenda, which is, you know, it's hugely important. And I could not agree more with Gavin. I mean, you know, from the people that we talk to, Nobody wants to go back to that January 2020. You know, there is this circuit breaker now within um, society as a whole, with the horror of COVID as it is, where people, you know, want more and they're going to expect more. I think they're going to demand more. Yeah, and um, one of the comments on uh, the chat was actually from Jonathan Gaines. He said, high quality professional field threat management buildings will also raise market standards and expectations across the wider PRS sector over time, which will also help benefit those in rental by default, which I totally agree with. And yeah. that's another area where um, hopefully the, the ministers, um, constituents will see see more of that in areas where we've got proof points of build to rent and they've gone to see it. Um, so I'm just going to go back to you, um, James, on 
the same question I asked Will about what can the sector do to support joining up of approaches locally, regionally and um, nationally? Well, joining up our messages is key. I mean, we're still a young sector, you know, and we need, we need to do more to sort of join up those messages. Um, and again, I think, you know, I've mentioned COVID a couple of times, but I think it's going to be increasingly important as we emerge from COVID. Um, you know, the, the reimagining of city centres, we had a really interesting conversation with a, one of the large local authorities um, in, the, in the country this week about their aspirations for their new city centre in terms of it being repurposed as, again, as we move forward. Uh, and it's encouraging, I think, from us because we are getting more and more invitations to become part of working groups, predominantly a local level at the moment, um, about how those spaces within city centres are going to be actually delivered. Um, and I agree with Will. I mean, I think the thing is we just need to continue to do it better and we need to sort of bang that drum even louder. And coming on events like this is really important. Responding to consultation documents is really important. Um, hopefully ministers do read it and MPs, I appreciate, are really busy. Um, but, you know, again, we've had great engagement. We've just got planning um, for a big scheme down in Brighton and Hove um, and the local MP there, Peter Carl, has been a huge supporter, you know, and he's been to see us and Gavin's point about taking politicians around development absolutely you know we should encourage all of these politicians the Secretary of State is more than welcome to come to Angel Gardens whenever he has time come and look at what Bill to Rent can actually deliver um, from a community point of view so I think all of those things are, are really really important um, you know the open market house builders have been doing it a lot longer than we have um, and maybe their tentacles into government extend a bit further than ours do currently and we need to work harder on that. Yeah. They, they definitely do. <laughs> I said, if you, I, mean, I can tell you from experience, if you're a housing minister, uh, you get appointed as a minister, there's a sort of procession of people to be, who are brought in to see you. And the two at the front of the queue are the House Builders Federation representing the big builders and the National Housing Federation representing the housing associations. And over time, you need to get yourselves further up that queue. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually, because um, obviously those two, um, uh, you know, the the, con the contractors, the developers, they are such a huge part of the economy. The housing associations are a huge part of the accommodation side. And at the moment, I think we're like, I don't know, about three to four percent of, of the um, PRS market, which is de minimis compared to other um, housing providers. Um, Will, what do you think that we could do in terms of that elevating, you know, the sector? Um, and, and you work across all of those um, sectors, I imagine, with Arcadis. What do you think in Gavin's? Yeah, I, th I, I think I think we've probably um, touched on, uh, you know, most of the aspects. I think um, it's it is, you know, all the things we talked about around, you know, communicating with the the political uh, groups. Did you, uh, did I lose my connection just then? That's okay. You said communicating with various groups. Okay. Um, and, you know, exactly as James is saying, I agree with everything James said, basically, in terms of the consultations being absolutely critical. Um, and, and obviously the joined up message. I think when we look at other construction sectors, the infrastructure sector being a very good example, there's some very coordinated and joined up messaging that has proved to be very effective at, uh, at delivering on the outcomes for that sector seeks. So, Kevin, what, what, you know, those two, those two people who come um, first in the parade of the housing men and stuff, what, what makes them so important? So I think it's, I think it's scale in, in terms of the, you know, the proportion of the new homes that are being built uh, that they're contributing to. But you can look at the question the other way around, right? So what, what I found was when I started the job, people would come in to me and say, We've got a housing crisis, and this is what you need to do to help us. And they, and I was like, okay, well, that's fine, but you're already building lots of houses, and I can't imagine that your business model is going to allow you to double the number of houses that you build. So surely the question is as much, what do I do to get some other people to start building homes that aren't doing it at all at the moment? And so, you know, on the on the for sale side, the pr the problem is not so much that you know, Taylor Wimpy or Persimmon or whoever aren't building enough homes, it's more that we've destroyed the small and medium sized builders in this country over about a 20, 20, you know, the last two recessions had a big impact on SME builders. And, you know, 
one of the things that really struck me was a sort of briefing, well, let's look at New York compared to London. You've got a huge uh, build to rent sector there. What, you know, why didn't we have this in this country? So I was more interested in like, rather than being faced into this traditional either or choice that we build more council houses or we try and get the big builders to build more, how do we get everyone building more? And most importantly, bring some new people in that are deploying fresh capital that can that can add. Because if you want to get up to 300,000 homes a year, there is no way that housing associations and the large volume house builders are going to do that on their own. It's, it's not possible. <clears throat> so it seems like we're going in a bit of a circle here that we need to get more scale and, and, and essentially more market share to get um, more... Um, visibility in government and get higher up that hierarchy of standing in line to meet the housing minister but yet we we may have some uh, issue well, issues or i guess the topic comes along now is that what opportunities do the proposed planning changes present for build to rent is this is this going to help us you know will james in your opinion to 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 produce more houses or produce more build to rent and get us you know more market share and get us in front of government and do we need to get in front of government? But let's let's focus on the first question. Will James, who wants to go first? Sure. Yeah, I'll try, I'll chuck a thought into the ring. So I think you know, looking at the consultation, I mean, as James said earlier, there's not a lot of mention of BTR specifically. But I think one thing that could be interesting is is how the zoning uh, sort of proposals are approached. Because you know, if for example, you could allocate um, land parcels specifically for BTR, um, I think I mentioned earlier, you know could that be a way to help um, with the viability equation, uh, which we're often working with clients on around that, that difficulty that BTR has had, certainly over the last few years, competing for land uh, with, say, for sale developers. So I think that's an area of interest is, is how that zoning approach could help break down uh, that challenge for the sector. I think, um, I think the white paper's got a number of challenges within it and uh, you know, I was reading interestingly Gavin went quite critical of the standard methodology too which I have some reservations about as well but just looking at sort of the white paper in terms of will it deliver additional housing I'm not sure yet because I don't think there's enough information in it I mean one of the things that our planning system has suffered from is that it's had to take on multiple new issues you know over the course of the last few decades whether it's you know environmental social etc and that's in the context of big slashing of planning officers, you know, frontline resourcing within our planning system is a real issue. And within the white paper, it talks about a follow on report about resourcing um, and also about modernization and spend within the spending review. And, and those are going to be really critical parts of whether the new notional planning system is going to be able to deliver, you know, the, the, the step change in relation to affordable. I mean, <clears throat> There are some good bits in there, definitely. You know, the modernization, the digitalization, there's some really good elements in, in there. But I'm, I worry about the local plan and overloading the local plan system. Um, I think I described it in an article recently as a, a heavily crowded dance floor, you know, in relation to trying to promote all of development all the way through that, what will become a very narrow funnel within the local plan. Um, it's it's a real challenge, and I think without that sort of element of resourcing sitting around it, then it's it's a difficult thing to be able to to answer, Leslie, at the moment. But I think when you look at what we do, we are with brownfield regeneration, highly sustainable locations. Think about the challenges that we've got. It's mainly about land coming forward, and it's about land availability more than anything else, and it's about trying to find places where you get that level of encouragement, you know, from an investor's point of view, to come and invest in that location, not necessarily in that particular site from a build to rent perspective. <clears throat> and I worry going back to sort of the specifics of, you know, zoning, although I'm, I'm not sure that we're meant to call it zoning, it's sort of a allocation, isn't it? Um, you know, within a growth area, if you're automatically going to get an outline consent on the adoption of the plan, and let's say there are 30 all running at the same time, not sure that's going to be enough for the funds. You're still going to have to go through that detailed permission phase to get that certainty where a fund is going to lend. So if you twist the question around slightly, is we need government to really acknowledge the sector and encourage new investment to come into what is a hugely resilient sector in the built-to-rent sector. Now, there's lots of investment coming in at the moment, but we could do more. 
we should be encouraging international and national investment to come into the sector. That's really what we really want to, to see. What, what do you think is, is preventing more? Well, in terms of investment? Yeah. I think it's, again, I think it's some of the things that we've touched on already. I think it's, you know, that acknowledgement that it's an important part to play uh, and that the government will acknowledge the fact that Bill to Rent has got this you know, significant role to play. I think you know, I read some Savills data the other day. I think we've got around about 170,000 Bill to Rent homes in the pipeline. You know, it's, it's, it's got huge potential. It's huge potential to grow that. And you know, Gavin's point about um, having different elements within that overall housing sector is absolutely right. If we're going to get anywhere close to 300,000. Well, 170 certainly is getting closer than before. Uh, but it's a per annum number. I mean, we, you know, this is just, it's compounding all of the time. But yeah. we, we shouldn't, it can't just be a numbers game either. This is about quality of provision and it's about those communities. Otherwise, we're going to repeat some of the failures from, you know, decades ago. Yeah, Kevin, you look like you've got something to say there. Yeah, no, so I'm, the planning thing fascinates me. So look, I'm a, I would be a little bit more positive about it, but the, the first thing I think James is spot on about is resourcing of local authority planning departments. So we tried to improve that a bit in, in the white paper when I was the minister and increase fees and try, but there is a lot more to be done there. If you want to put the planning system right, you've got to make sure local authority planning departments have got highly skilled people that can deal with the volume of work that's coming. Where, where do I think there are unalloyed good things in here? Um, Digitisation and speeding up the process of plan making and trying to ensure that you've got complete up to date plan coverage across the country. I think that's really important. And I think the design section of the paper is really good as well. And I think that's something the Secretary of State personally is very passionate about. Then I think there are two um, two big areas where they could be onto something, but the devil is completely in the detail as to whether they get it right. So the thing that most interests me is the proposal to get rid of section 106 and SIL and replace it with this new levy. And I think if you get that right and you guarantee that you still get at least as much affordable housing provided on site, um, then that could be a huge win in terms of speeding up the process and removing a lot of the un uncertainty that exists and all the mess that we've got at the moment around viability assessments but the devil is completely in the detail and it's not clear from that document exactly how the new system would work and then the other issue which is core as James was saying is land availability and that's probably where I've got my biggest concern because it feels to me at the moment this algorithm that they've come up with is completely out of sync with everything else the government says it wants to do so if you if you asked me what is you know COVID aside what is the government's number one domestic policy priority I would say it's levelling up the UK economy, trying to ensure that uh, parts of the Midlands and the North see as much economic productivity as you do in London and sort of wider South East. And yet when it comes to housing, this algorithm is just following where the existing demand is and saying, we'll carry on building all the homes, well, not all the homes, but a vast majority of the homes in London and in the South East. And actually, there are a number of major Midlands towns and cities that would be building fewer homes under this algorithm than they're actually doing at the moment. And that strikes me as completely nuts. So there is a way here, I think, of trying to ensure the system is rele releasing the amount of land that we need to tackle the crisis. But the geographical distribution in this system at the moment doesn't seem to be to be right or to fit with the government's wider objectives in terms of rebalancing the economy. Yeah, Will, did you want to add on to that? What's your thoughts on the on the levy situation? I think I, I think I agree with all that. I think um, you know we have to see how the consultation goes, and and as Gavin says, we need to see more detail probably. I mean, I think a couple of other things I'd mention, and I think um, you know we've touched on the availability of land. So I think access to public land is something that could be looked at, you know, even more. Mm. Um, I touched on SDLT earlier, but probably also you know Brexit presents opportunities around looking at regimes around VAT, for example, which you know can disadvantage uh, residential sector and particularly on the re repair and maintenance front compared to some of the other property sectors so of course for build trade that's particularly important and that could you know could have you know it all has an impact doesn't it on on, on the viability of of, uh, of the sector um, and the schemes it's delivering and then i guess the last thing i'd, I'd just chuck in really is uh you know could more guaranteeing of finance be looked at government back guaranteeing of finance and btr so um, you know, finance conditions, although there's a lot of investment chasing BTR, financing conditions are tightening 
for for kind of obvious reasons around the economic reality at the moment. Um, but actually, you know, there is money there potentially to help guarantee some of that financing and get get schemes going from that perspective as well. So just, um, will you touch there on um, public land? And um, interestingly, we haven't really talked about public private partnerships and whether that's something that this sector could focus more on. And is it something that the government is sort of supportive of? It's BT, uh, BTR is sort of very private sector at the moment. It's, um, it's institutional funds um, and it, it's, it's performing well uh, in that regard. But would that open up opportunity? Is there appetite from that from the halls of power? Or is it just sort of individual? I mean, LNG do a lot of this stuff and other, other partners too, but is there something that we could focus on more? I mean, so my, my view would be yes. Um, I think there, there is, you know, it's, hap it's happening already, um, but it, there could be more of it. And I think, you know, it's potentially a huge opportunity, um, you know, in a, in a way for everybody, because firstly, um, you know, and, and James touched on this earlier, you've got that long term commitment um, from BTR operators. So actually, the objectives around, you know, the community are, are generally pretty aligned or even completely aligned. And the, um, you know, you've got that element of private investment. So at a time where we need to uh, regenerate communities across the UK, we need to, um, you know, regenerate high streets across the UK, there's that money potentially there to help do that. I, I mentioned earlier around BTR relatively can help create communities quite quickly. You know, so actually you've got, um, from a sort of people perspective, you're actually creating communities, but then of course that also means you're getting tax flowing in from you know council tax and so on quicker mm -hmm. as well there's potential um environmental benefits that we've touched on and and i think to james's earlier point as well you know again uh, diverse communities and you know i suppose there's the opportunity around actually within btr there's there's a great variety of product um and a great variety of uh of you know of tenants um so i think all of these are opportunities really for those private public partnerships and the more diverse the community, the stronger that they are, because there's more price points, of course, and there's more depth of um, community, um, strength of community, which helps the economy. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Gavin, do you think that there's appetite from the government for private, pu public private partnerships? And James, I'm going to ask you why, if Moda hasn't done that before, if they'd be interested in that sort of thing or if it's necessary. So, Gavin, you. I don't, I don't think the government would be hostile to it. I don't think it's pushing for it particularly. I, mean, I think from the government's point of view, actually the attractiveness is just bringing in private money to get to get more homes, homes built. But I think certainly with local authority partners, um, that could potentially be a very attractive offering. And I think that the point that Will was making earlier, and I suppose it was one of the sort of key things when I was trying to sort of fight the argument within the Conservative Party about a sort of mixed 10-year housing policy, one of the key arguments I used was actually all everything everybody told me, whether it was the big house builders, the housing associations, whoever, was if you've got a big site, you've got to develop out having a partnership where you've got multi tenure different players developing different tenures of housing alongside each other was far and away the quickest way to get that site built out quickly. And actually, you'd get more homes of each specific type quicker with that kind of partnership approach than you would if you just left it to one person to, to build out on their own. So I certainly think with local authorities, uh, developing some public-private partnerships could be an attractive way forward. And I was very struck by what Jane said, uh, that you know one of the real public policy challenges that we're gonna have over the next few years is transforming our town and city centers because there's no doubt this pandemic is, has massively accelerated the shift in retail to yeah. online. Yeah. Uh, and that is going to mean we are going to need to envision differently what our town centers are for and how they work. And the government is going to be really interested in that because, you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier, if, if their main priority is levelling up the economy and improving particularly towns in the Midlands and the North where they've won seats at the election, they've got to hold them. One of the things that defines how we feel about our place and how it's doing, whether it's going up or going backwards, is how does our town or city centre feel? So I think there's huge opportunities there. Yeah, um, another example of public... I say public, but um, is uh, private partnership is Granger and um, TFL and how they're transforming some of those, you know, that infrastructure hubs. So James, um, public private partnerships, something Motor is interested in or anything holding them back or just not 
necessarily necessary at this point. Absolutely. Um, I think the thing for us is it's about delivery. You know, for us, our business plan is all predicated on opening doors and getting people into new homes. So sometimes there is this um, preponderance that those sorts of things can take quite a long time. You know, that there's a need to streamline those processes. I mean, we have a number of conversations ongoing right now with local authorities about land availability and us being brought in as a partner. But it's navigating the rules about best value and how that is actually defined um, and that they're not going to get challenged later on by doing a, you know, a solace agreement with one operator, for example, where really what you want to be able to do is to just cut through that and get on with it um, and deliver quickly so the answer to the question is yes absolutely I mean we're very flexible you know subject to planning deals or long leases or whatever it might be because what we're trying to do is to take positions in key locations in key cities and key towns you know to deliver quickly um, and again I think it comes back to this you know the prime minister's build 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 you know I'll translate that into delivery 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 you know we we want to get on with it um, and from our point of view, you know, investment and sites need to marry up together so we can deliver quickly. And, you know, that's really what we're, we're all about. Uh, and I think, you know, there are a number of very good build to rent operators out there doing exactly the same. Um, just conscious of time, there's two questions that I'm going to just direct to two individuals for one, one minute answer. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Dave to just sum up for um, some of the stuff on the UK AA. So, James, why hasn't Build to Rent grown to the extent previously predicted? Savile's expected the sector to be 200,000 by now. Currently, there are circa 167,000. Many of those could not, in reality, pass the test of being Build to Rent as envisaged by the ULI. I think some of those things we've answered in terms of difficulty of land values is there, um, and availability of sites. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? I think so. I think we've probably covered the majority of it. Um, again, I think the more encouragement that we can get as a sector to stick to that high quality mantra, you know, of, of that long term stewardship and long term management um, is absolutely key. But we, you know, we can't just sit here and think we've got it cracked. You know, we need to continue to innovate all of the time. So it is a challenge. Um, land availability is a challenge in getting locations in the right uh, places. Uh, infrastructure investment we've not touched on again I think that's that's a huge piece um, you know, we're doing a lot of work in the West Midlands and there is going back to this point about public partnerships you know we've we've got some great relationships in the West Midlands and we've created a, an employment hub for example with the West Midlands Combined Authority and Birmingham City Council with our contractors contractor CISC and we've delivered 140 you know, new jobs again that's just an example of that sort of um, partnership arrangement we can but going back to the question I think it's it's a combination of all of those things really and we just need to we need to do it better and we need to do it quicker yeah it's and it's a it, it doesn't help when COVID was in the middle of it but we're certainly uh, ticking along better than a lot of other sectors um, Will this is this is an operational question but you may know um, some of the answers to share it around most build to rent developments are high rise towers but the biggest housing trend post covid has been demand for garden space how can build to rent shift its focus to match this demand how long is the average build to rent tenancy to ensure that a long term community is created yeah so I, well i think we are seeing that shift actually to an extent so i think um, what we're hearing from clients is um you know they are increasingly looking at you know what we might call suburban um built to rent in a sort of much more serious way so i think we're going to see a lot more in the market on that and i would add that there are already a number of you know very mature players in in that space as well um you know sigma is a, is a, is a really good example um wise living also so i think we'll we'll see a move to that um and I think in terms of the, the sort of uh, tenancy lengths, I think, you know, uh, that's one of the that's one of the cells of, of BTR really, isn't it, to, to government particularly, is that actually the, the sector is very interested in offering long term tenancy. So I think the average is probably something like three years. Um, but I think, you know, we can't forget that, of course, it, it is in, you know, it's in a landlord's interest that they have their their product filled and people paying rent for it. So I think um, in that to that extent, it's very uh, commensurate with the, the aspiration around long-term rents 
but also the security that it gives the tenant. The difficulty about um, measuring build to rent and long term tenancy is that it's a relatively new sector. So some of the oldest properties that we have is maybe the Keel in Liverpool, which is one of the first ones, Aberfeldy in Barking, which is one of Granger's. Um, and actually, they're not that old. They're only three or four years, or maybe four or five years old now. Um, but average tenant tenure length from a, I can speak from my own perspective of managing large portfolios of mixed tenure, but some of them are built to rent. It's about three and a half years. So that gives you some idea of these are longer term communities and they do, residents do value um, the flexibility, but also the certainty of being able to stay because build to rent landlords obviously want that occupancy. So we've got two minutes. I know Dave wants to do a bit of a plug on some of the UK, uh, the Festival of Rent coming up, but I just wanted to say thank you very much, our panelists, Will, James, Gav. Um, lovely to have you on. I really appreciate your inputs. Um, and uh, thank you again to Arcadis and to UKA for hosting, uh, the, for hosting this webinar. Dave, what have we got on, on the UK? Wow. We've got, we've got lots of things going on, Leslie, um, but I want to start off by just thanking uh, everyone on the panel for reinforcing my agenda for the next year. Um, Leslie and I have spent a lot of time talking about the need for the organisation uh, to be more vocal, to be more adv to advocate for the sector better, to produce information, to work together. And that's something that, that you'll see us uh, addressing um, over the next uh, 12 months, um, hopefully with some effect. I think the need for consistency to work together, to share common messages, uh, to express the social and economic value of the sector is, is absolutely crucial and do it in a way which gives our members operate, uh, give members ammunition to talk to government and help gives politicians um, something to, re to refer to. Um, but then, yeah, as Leslie said, there's a couple of uh, 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 public sector and public service messages I'd like to give. First one is in terms of consultations. The Anyone who hasn't thought about it, the first homes consultation closes at 11.45 p.m. tonight. Uh, I know last time we talked to NHCLG, there hadn't been a huge number of responses from the built to rent sector. Uh, and I think it's a potentially an issue which, which does affect us. Uh, we'll be putting in a response. And if anyone wants to talk about what responses they could put in, do come back to us. The second is um, we've heard a lot of great stuff about the motor scheme. Um, and we have our festival of built to rent coming up. Um, early bird tickets available now and part of the highlights of that will be a number of virtual study tours and one of those will be of Angel Gardens uh, in, in Manchester if you want to find out more about that see what it looks like understand the tech that James has been talking about we'll be doing a, a, a good piece on that so get your tickets now um, so what else what else have we got coming up over the next month as you know we always have a busy webinar program next week we're talking about sustainability in the built environment with our friends from Osborne Clark after that, on the 13th, we've got a really interesting view into the future, living in the next normal. What are the tips that you might want to, what have we learned from people's experiences over lockdown? Um, uh, the end of the month, we've got the tech stack presented by Smart Rent, um, who's you know, backed by Amazon. Um, and then maybe the highlight of the month on the 14th, with our friends at Crest in VPF, we'll be launching the BTR Hub, uh, one stop. Uh, access to the sector information. But finally, so at, at, at the end of the day, I would just like to thank everybody again for you know, a really good webinar. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. I certainly have. I've learned a lot. I've got a long list of things I now need to do. Um, but it's been great. Thank you, James. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Leslie, as ever. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Cheerio. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye now.